Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. We've taken the last few weeks off from our event due to the holiday, but I must say we're just thrilled to be back with you today. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons and researchers during the past ev events. If you've missed any of our presentations and would like to view them, please email me. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're switching up our format a little. We're highlighting a patient and his experience. I'm delighted that the mayor of Danbury, Connecticut, Mayor Mark Bowton, can join us today. He started out as a patient and has become a friend to all of us. We love to hear great stories like you're about to hear from Mark, so please reach out and tell us yours as well. I'd like to now introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Robert Friedlander. Dr. Friedlander is the Walter E. Dandy Professor and Chair of UPMC in the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery. He's the head of cerebrovascular neurosurgery, the director of complex brain surgery, and also co-director of the UPMC Neurological Institute. I could go on and on about Dr. Friedlander's awards and accomplishments over his remarkable career, but I'll let his presentation speak for itself. I will mention, that Dr. Friedlander was more recently inducted into the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. Election to this academy is considered one of the highest honors in the fields of health and medicine and recognizes individuals who have demonstrated outstanding professional achievement and commitment to service. I would like to now welcome our Chairman of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander. Dr. Friedlander, thank you and please take it away. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and uh, really it's truly a pro uh, pleasure to be uh, with all of you uh, today and to have uh, Mayor Barton join us uh, today is uh, very special for me uh, personally. As I've done in uh, prior uh, events, uh, what I do first is I'd like to uh, provide a short update on the situation of uh, the COVID crisis in Western uh, PA and as it pertains to our UPMC hospitals, and then I'll uh, move on to my presentation. Uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, things uh, have changed. Uh, there has been a significant increase in the number of uh, COVID uh, cases uh, within uh, Western Pennsylvania, but still the number of cases overall in uh, Western Pennsylvania as well as in UPMC is fairly low in comparison to many other areas of uh, the country. Uh, our hospitals uh, remain extremely safe. Uh, we're taking extreme precautions to amplify the safety. Uh, everybody gets a questionnaire as they walk into the hospital. Uh, we're measuring uh, everybody's uh, temperature to make sure that everybody's afebrile coming into the hospital, we're limiting traffic uh, through the hospital. So we feel fairly safe in both coming to work and taking care of our patients, which we've been doing uh, for the past uh, couple of months uh, now. So again, anybody that uh, needs care, uh, I urge uh, you to come into the hospital. Don't delay care. Uh, bad things can happen when that uh, occurs. So to go on uh, with uh, my presentation at this point, and, and the title uh, of it uh, uh, states, uh, we can go to the slides now, please. Uh, brain surgery when the stakes are high. And you, know, you could say the stakes are always high when, when you do brain surgery, but what I want to talk in particular is about certain kinds of lesions or tumors that are in very, very important parts of the brain and what recent technological advances that we've uh, taken uh, and pushed forward here at uh, the University of Pittsburgh and at UPMC have made our surgery safer for our patients. Uh, what I want to do next is really to show a slide of uh, my neurosurgical family. This is a slide from a graduation a couple of years ago uh, with all the residents and the faculty there. I'm extremely proud of the prowess of uh, all these individuals, uh, each one of them of our faculty members. Uh, they're leaders uh, in their field, both nationally and internationally, and our residents uh, really secure coveted academic positions uh, throughout the country. So really want to thank uh, all my uh, partners and the residents uh, that I work with. Now, here's a picture of the brain, and throughout uh, today's presentation, we'll accomplish a few things. You're going to learn about the brain, 
Um, you're going to learn about uh, new imaging techniques. I will be showing uh, some surgery, so again, to uh, warn people uh, as well, but uh, th they'll be very, very uh, illustrative of uh, the points I am trying to make. So the brain, um, you know, you've all seen pictures of the brain. Obviously, this is an illustration here, and different parts of the brain control different functions. There's some that are incredibly important. For example, the red here, the motor cortex that uh, controls movement, the sensory cortex uh, controls sensation, uh, this is the auditory area. This is a visual area, for example. This is uh, Wernicke's area. That's where you um, think of the words you want to say and understand uh, speech. And uh, here's a, a, a in yellow Broca's area. That's where you actually uh, speak. So on the surface, there are a lot of different uh, er parts of the brain where very, very specific functions. The other areas here in gray are areas where, with more diffuse uh, thought, like uh, some memories or personality of diff or different issues. And those are less eloquent uh, areas. I'll call them a little less important. Every part of the brain is important, but some of them have very, very specific uh, functions. Now, on the surface of the brain, uh, we could see this, what's called the homunculus, where different parts of the brain, th this is the sensory area and this is the motor area, where every part of the brain we know where what part of the body controls, controls the finger, controls the arm, the face, and so on and so forth. So on the surface of the brain, we have very, very good information as to where the functions uh, are, and we can test them either preoperatively or during surgery. Now, in contrast, the deeper structures, and I'll give you an example here. Here's the speech uh, apparatus for the brain. You have here Wernicke's area. As I said, that's where you think of the words and understand what's being said. And here's Broca's area. That's where the speech is, is uh, produced. The arcuate fasciculus, which is deep in the brain, it's not on the surface, are the connections between one area and the other area. And this clearly, it's an illustration. Now, in each person, it's a little bit different. Furthermore, um, the speech area for most people is dominant on the left side. Most functions of the brain are in both sides, regulating both sides of the body, but the speech is usually on one side or the other, which typically it's the left side. Now, when, when we see a patient that has a lesion somewhere in the brain. A common study that we get is a brain MRI, which provides us structural information of the brain. It, it tells us different parts of uh, the brain, but doesn't tell us anything about the connections. One of the things that I'll talk to you about today is something which a lot of it was developed here at the University of Pittsburgh and at UPMC called HDFT, High Definition Fiber Tractography. This is a method where we can really delineate the connections between different parts of the brain in a very, very specific manner. Other places uh, have techniques called DTI or tractography, which also provide this information, but the information that's produced here at the University of Pittsburgh has been, uh, it's gone through uh, actually international competitions and it's the most precise one. And this is really, really important. You want your neurosurgeon when they're going into your brain to know with precision where these connections are, not to guess, but to know and what it is in each specific uh, patient. I want to really call out two individuals who have been key at developing uh, this technology, Walt Schneider, uh, and uh, Frank Ye, really two phenomenal uh, uh, PhDs that work uh, uh, with us and within our department that have developed uh, this technology and have done a phenomenal job at developing this. So what I'll do through today's uh, talk is I will provide a number of examples uh, with uh, patients. I'll provide several of them. And at the end, I will, ha I'll introduce uh, the mayor so he can uh, uh, describe his case and we'll go from there. So this one case, this is a lady that presented with speech difficulty. And what she has, and there are lesions that I will be talking about that today quite a bit, is an example called cavernous malformations. Cavernous malformations are abnormalities of the veins of the brain, that the veins, they form a conglomeration of, a, of, a, of a structures. They bleed, they bleed once in a while, and I'll talk a little bit about their uh, natural uh, history, and they cause damage depending on where they are. So with this one, this is what's called a coronal slice. It's from top to bottom, so that's the top of the brain, and you can see the ears here, so these are the sides, and that's the bottom, and here's the brain. All that's gray in the sequence is, is the brain. The white is the fluid of the brain, the ventricles where the fluid is made. This is where this cavernous malformation is. 
That's a coronal section. This was called an axial section, which is a slice, uh, essentially like a loaf of bread that's being uh, sliced. And you could see the lesion here. Now, from looking at the structural MRI, I do not know where th this patient's arcuate fasciculus is. And again, the arcuate fasciculus is the part that connects Broca's area and Wernicke's area for speech to be uh, uh, produced uh, from, from that point of view. So if I were to operate on this lesion, knowing exactly where the arcuate fasciculus is, is critical to obtain the best possible uh, outcome. So again, if the lesion is it's in this part of the arcuate fasciculus, I want to know exactly where the arcuate fasciculus is. So here's a, a, a little illustration that we made. So this is a brain. Uh, you could see Broca's area in the uh, Wernicke's uh, area here, uh, the other way around, Wernicke's and Broca's area, and you have the arcuate fasciculus there connecting these two uh, structures. Now, if there's a lesion that grows, we don't know with precision what's happened to the arcuate fasciculus. Is it being pushed up, down, laterally, medial? Is it cutting the fibers or is it pushing the fibers? And what I'll describe is, again, what high-definition fiber tractography provides for us in terms of this information. So with this patient that I just showed you, where is her arcuate fasciculus? And what you can see here is actually the arcuate fasciculus itself in this very specific patient. So this was called a sagittal view, uh, which is looking from the side. And this is this patient's arcuate fasciculus is here. And her lesion is right down there. And what you could tell, one is it's not surprising why she presented with some speech uh, difficulty. But furthermore, you could see that if I do an operation and I come from above here, I would cut all these fibers and she would not be able to speak ever again. I needed to come really from the side and from below to be able to take this out safely. Another thing that we can do is really look and turn this around. And as you could see here, I'll move it around, that you could see some of these fibers have been cut and some of these fibers have been pushed up. And for this specific uh, patient, that's why she's having the speech difficulty because part of these fibers have been severed. And if I sever the rest of these coming from above, as I mentioned, she will never be able to speak again. So having that information and knowing with certainty where these important connections were and are, were critical to be able to perform this operation safely on this patient. So this is, again, her arcuate fasciculus, the lesion. So this is before surgery and after surgery that I was able to really remove this and she remained uh, just fine uh, and never had any other problems with, uh, with that uh, lesion. So again, knowing with certainty is really, really important. Now, when we do any kind of operation, you know, the, the neurological complications that we can have uh, through the surgery relate to a number of different issues. One issue is the approach. What do I need to do to get to where the lesion is? If the lesion is on the surface of the brain, then you don't have to go through the brain, but the approach itself, you can have complications from it. The one that's important and most pertinent to this uh, discussion today is interruption of what are, what are called white matter fibers to reach the lesion. So if, I, if the lesion is not on the surface and the surgeon needs to go through the brain to get to the lesion, there's some parts of the brain that are very safe, but some part of the brains that have a lot of function. This is what I call hyper eloquent regions of the brain that, that there's a lot of function uh, related to, to them. And you really, really want to know where these fibers are in that specific patient. Not, not what the book says, because the book obviously is just an average of the population, but very specifically in this patient where her uh, fibers are locating. And if you disrupt the fibers also, when you're removing the lesion or what's called here the cavity or cavernous malformation that can also cause further damage. Uh, and finally, you want to take the whole cavernoma out. If you leave some behind, potentially there could be additional uh, episodes of uh, bleeding at a later uh, time, but it's important to do this as safely as possible. Now, we need to think of when we take these cavernomas out. They're not tumors, like the tumors grow and most of the time you need to treat them, not always, uh, depending on the type of tumor and Location. So we, in general, but not always, we think of a lesion that's bled at least two times. Uh, but the key is, do we treat lesions that are inside a really important part of the brain differently? So if you do surgery on a very, very important part of the brain, there's a higher risk. There's a higher risk of neurological damage. On the other hand, if you watch it and there's a bleed, there's also a high risk because 
the lesion is located in a very important part of the brain, and if you damage it, then there could be uh, problems and neurological uh, damages. However, if we increase the safety of the resection, and m and is the morbidity and mortality of the therapy, and you, and you tilt the balance towards safety, then it makes you more eager to try to go and tackle these very, very like, challenging uh, lesions. Also, some patients present with epilepsy attributable to the lesions, so that would be another indication for resection of these uh, lesions. So I'll give you an example of, uh, of uh, this patient, a 23-year-old uh, uh, female that presented that uh, 10 years ago now uh, with you know severe double vision. She was barely able to move uh, her eyes, slurred speech, trouble swallowing. Her right side became uh, paralyzed, but these are three consecutive uh, bleeds within you know a month, a short uh, period of time. And you could see the lesion here, small, larger and larger. Uh, she lived in uh, Baltimore and eventually came here. We evaluated her. And this is actually the, within uh, my first month or two of arriving uh, to Pittsburgh in, in uh, June of uh, 2010. And you know we very carefully evaluated this, but this is in a really, really tricky part. This is what's called the brain stem, the stem of the brain that connects the brain with the spinal cord. Um, so there are a lot of really important functions. In addition of a connection between the brain and the spinal cord and the rest of the body, there are also a, are called the cranial nerves, which control, again, your vision, ability to move your eyes, uh, move your face, sensation of the face, swallowing, breathing, a lot of very, very important functions. So again, operating on this part of the brain stem has many, many potential uh, uh, risks and consequences. This is a, a, a very large uh, series published a number of years ago with uh, 300 uh, cases. Again, one of the largest uh, series uh, uh, around for these kinds of uh, lesions. And you could see th in expert hands, these are the number of complications. So new or worsening neurological symptoms at uh, 56%, permanent new deficits, 35% and other uh, very significant complications, patients needing a tracheostomy or feeding tube or CSF leak, 28%. So again, very high rate of complications. And what I wanted to do is figure out, is there a way that we can do this by increasing safety? So again, this is the patient I just uh, described. This is the lesion. Now to get to it, assuming we're gonna operate on it, you can come from the side, but you can see there's a rim of normal brain or brainstem around it. You can come from the front, but again, same way. And the other part that we don't know is where her cortical spinal tract is. The cortical spinal tract is the tract that controls movement, going from the brain through the brainstem into the spinal cord, controlling movement. And normally, if I look at the anatomy book, it should be here on this side, and there'll be another one on this side, but where is it? Now, you could tell this patient's not moving uh, the right side of the body, so maybe she'll never be able to recover, and I can go in, take the cavernoma out, and if she doesn't, if I keep her the same way if she was before surgery, after surgery, I could say it's a success. But I wanted to know, can we make him better? Not only not make him worse, but make him better. So now, this is the tractography in her. And what you can see is that the cortical spinal tract on one side, this is the normal side. You can see how many fibers it has, and you can see the location of where it is. There's a little bit of a 3D uh, rendering where you can see the cortical spinal tract here is being pushed back. So this tells me exactly where her cortical spinal tract is. And what's important that I told you is that she's not moving the right side of her body. And these, these, these left uh, fibers control the left uh, uh, side as well. And what you could see here is that um, she has fibers, and this is looking at it from uh, the side as well, showing that these red fibers are pushed uh, back. This is a different patient that has a lesion almost the same, identical to this, and his fibers uh, are pushed to the front. So again, you don't know if it's front, back, or where it is. This is, uh, again, surgery, and this is these patients' uh, brainstem, and that's where the, I, I knew the lesion was going to be under there, but there are going to be a few millimeters of normal brainstem that I had to go through to get to that uh, area. I knew that her fibers were in the back, so that's here, so I stayed away uh, from uh, that area. And when I go into her brain, in the brainstem, we find the blood, uh, we find the, I find the cavernous malformation, very carefully dissect it and, uh, and pull it out. And uh, she did uh, incredibly well after the surgery. Uh, this is her picture as Ashley. I believe she's going to be, uh, she's on uh, listening uh, uh, today. I have her permission to show this. She recovered really, really well. Um, I asked her for, she's a painter, her first watercolor to give to me, beautiful uh, water, watercolor that's uh, there and it's hanging in my office. Now, what's interesting, so this is where the lesion was. She has another one right here on the other side and it's on the motor cortex 
of, of the other side. So this is her good side. And we thought about it very hard as to what should we do about it. And, you know, we kept watching it because it was in a very critical part and it never bled. But, you know, 10 years later, here it is, it, it bled. And actually it bled, uh, this was just uh, yeah, in, into the first few days of uh, COVID when we were uh, starting to stop to do surgery and slowing the surgery down. And she came immediately here from uh, Baltimore. She came in, we did the uh, surgery on her. She did uh, very, very well. Uh, went home uh, first, second day after surgery and she's done exceedingly well. This is the, the old cavernoma where it was. And, uh, and uh, again, I'm just delighted that she's doing so well. So again, we're, it's not that we're not making patients worse, they're getting better. Another uh, patient, uh, Heather, who I believe is watching today uh, as well. Um, this is uh, you know, a number of years ago, she had the, this lesion. And the question, where is her cortical spinal tract? And what we could see is her cortical spinal tract is on the side here. So if we would operate from the side, which is my preferred way of, of doing this, I would have cut all these lesions, all, all these uh, tracks. And if these cuts, if these tracks are cut, they don't grow back and she wouldn't be able to move again. But here she was doing fairly well. Uh, and this is again the lesion, but um, she had a gamma knife, which again, sometimes uh, these lesions can be treated with this. But a year later, uh, she bled uh, again. And here's her tractography. The fibers are being moved back and I have a corridor uh, to get into it. So as we were getting prepared uh, to do surgery, uh, two days later, she had another very significant uh, bleed. And you could see here, the, uh, the, her cortical spinal tract is being pushed back uh, further. So I have a very good quarter, but now she's very, very weak uh, and she's having additional trouble. And you could say we should have operated on her beforehand, but if we cut these fibers, she would never be able to walk again. So again, this is surgery uh, on her. That's the temporal lobe that I'm being, I'm retracting up. And this is again, her brainstem where we're going into it. Uh, I find uh, the lesion uh, uh, fairly uh, quickly with the, um, uh, evacuate the bleeding, and that's the cavernoma that she had there, again, in the middle of her brainstem. And I know that her cortical spinal tract is right behind there, and that's why I'm, I'm staying away uh, from uh, from that area. We're able to remove uh, the cavernoma, and I, uh, and uh, she uh, went through her whole rehabilitation and did really, really well. And uh, again, we inspect the cavity, make sure nothing's there. And it was critical to stay away from the, the fibers there. Um, sometime later, she went through a lot of rehabilitation and I was very happy to be able to see her walk down the aisle uh, with uh, her father. And the reason that she was able to walk down the aisle is uh, uh, because these fibers that are here, you can see the cavernomas right there. And this is right behind uh, uh, her, uh, the, the lesion where we did uh, the surgery and they were there. She recovered uh, beautifully uh, well. Um, uh, at New Center 4 here in Pittsburgh, made a little uh, uh, news piece uh, about her, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes. So this is coming up now. This is Pittsburgh's Action News 4. The story we're about to show you is one of determination and inspiration. A 22-year-old IUP student had just gotten engaged when a few weeks later, tragedy struck. Pittsburgh's Action News 4 anchor Michelle Wright takes us through her journey to make it down the aisle. Heather said yes to her boyfriend Ron's proposal, but just a few weeks later, before she could even begin planning her walk down the aisle, a medical issue stopped Heather from being able to walk at all. So the only known cure is brain surgery to remove the lesion, but mine was so deep in my brain, they were concerned it would cause, the surgery would cause more damage than good. Here is a look at the problem MRIs. She had a cluster of weak blood vessels in her brain stem called cavernous anginoma. Over the next year, she'd have five brain hemorrhages, and the last one was so severe, it paralyzed the right side of her body. Describe how tricky this is. Very sensitive. This is as tricky as it gets in brain surgery. This is right in the middle of the brain. This is the brain stem where most of the really important functions from the brain are located. UPMC's chairman of neurological surgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, explains these red images you see are the important fibers controlling the left side of her body. The weak blood vessels were rupturing and cutting off the fibers from the brain stem. At the beginning, these were the fibers that were there. Look how 
many fewer fibers she has. And that's what there. limited her movement. And that's what limited her movement. And if this was destroyed, she would never be able to move that part of her body. Heather knew the risk, but there was really no choice. She told Ron he did not have to stick around, but he said he wasn't going anywhere. And so their journey, for better or worse, began long before their vow. To be so young and to have such a strong love for each other and to really see at a young age before we even start a marriage what uh, hardship is and you know what challenges can lie ahead. And so to have that so young, you know, it just brought us even closer, showed what love really was and showed that, you know, we got through this, we can get through anything. With that support and her own determination, three years later, Ron watched his bride walk down the aisle. It was breathtaking, it was, you know, because I, I was there when she was in a wheelchair and I was there when I saw her walk down the hallway at the hospital for the first time, then to stand there and see her walk down that aisle two years later was amazing. And to be able to be walking towards Ron and who he helped me. And I used to look at him when I was learning how to walk at Mercy. And now I was putting it all together and walking down towards him to marry him. So it was very special. And right there with them celebrating their wedding was Dr. Friedlander. In fact, he had no idea, but at the reception, Heather was saving that third dance for him. A miracle bride, her surgeon, and her family celebrating this new chance at life. Michelle Wright, Pittsburgh's Action News 4. For any of you wondering, that is what love looks like. Oh, and for your surgeon to come and support oh you and have such a connection, you love that. Well, get this, Heather just celebrated her 25th birthday, has graduated, is now looking for work, <laughs> and looking forward to starting a family with Ron. Uh, what a uh, really a great uh, story. I know that Heather is watching uh, today. She's writing a, a book about her experience. I was uh, fortunate to uh, write an introduction uh, for it, and uh, we'll be sure to advertise it when it uh, comes up. But really a great story. But what's important is that we're able to achieve these outcomes because we really understand the anatomy in the individual person that tractography is providing. So when we look at the outcomes, we, we're really transforming what happens. I showed you at the beginning that really a large proportion of patients under the most expert hands are doing worse after surgery. Our patients are actually doing better overall. So uh, some of them have a, a transient uh, worsening after surgery, but really all of these worsenings get better uh, or they have gotten uh, better and it's from pushing some of the fibers around. There have been no new permanent uh, deficits and the preoperative symptoms, a lot of them are improving. So again, partially in 64% of the patients, completing 36% uh, percent of the patients. So that to me is the most remarkable part that we've been able to transform from patients getting worse after surgery to actually getting better and removing these lesions. So in conclusion from this part of the talk, really tractography is provided critical anatomical uh, information for us to be able to select the patients, the timing, the way that we do the surgery and exactly all the details of uh, surgery really to delineate around the lesion what's important and, and what we should stay away with. And as I mentioned, our preliminary experience is that tractography appears to be a really good adjunct to decrease complications during surgery. And one of the things that I keep telling my trainees is that even if a patient is not worse during surgery, which sometimes is the standard, does not mean that we did our best. And to do our best, we really need to understand the, the anatomy. So. I want to uh, transition now. I've talked a lot about cavernous malformations as an example uh, of, uh, of a lesion. I want to introduce uh, Mayor uh, Mark, ba Mark Bowden, who uh, has become a, a friend over the past uh, several years. Uh, he's uh, uh, a star mayor of uh, Danbury, Connecticut, uh, being uh, there serving 10 consecutive uh, terms. Uh, I think that's a record and uh, really a fantastic guy. So uh, Mayor Bowden, why don't you uh, please uh, let us know um, about your symptoms, your symptoms, uh, what happened and how you ended up in UPMC. Thank you for having me on today. And um, just like all of your other patients, very similar symptoms, uh, had um, uh, loss of vision, uh, had uh, several mini uh, seizures, if you will, um, had something called asphasia. Uh, which, as you know, is a loss of speech. That's my dog. Um, 
and um, you know, just didn't know what was going on. Went all over uh, the Northeast looking for help uh, till somebody finally determined that uh, I did in fact have um, a lesion or, or a tumor, uh, but nobody wanted to touch it. And I went to the best un universities, the best best places in the world, places, places like Lenox Hill, uh, Mass General, um, I, I, Columbia Presbyterian, and everybody said, listen, uh, Yale even said, well, we'll give it a shot, but we're not sure. But everybody sort of had the same thing. They gave me a card and they said, you got to get a hold of this guy, uh, Dr. Robert Freelander. And so I brought the card back to my personal physician who, you know, and I said, you know this guy and, and how do we get a hold of him? And 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 voila, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was out to see you. So um, I had a terrific outcome like the rest of your patients. Uh, it was a blessing to get to know you and your family and uh, certainly the team at UPMC and um, in just Pittsburgh in general also is a, a, a great community to the point where now I've sent multiple patients out there uh, and one is returning today uh, with a very similar outcome to all the rest of us have and uh, we are a cult, a bunch of groupies of, of Dr. Freelander and the technology that he brings to us to, to make us better. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for uh, sharing uh, sharing your story. So now I'll show your brain as we've done uh, before in a news conference. Uh, the mayor's uh, brain, um, I think, is the first brain of a politician that's been watched in, on live TV. There are brains there. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a lot of brains. So this is his, uh, the mayor's uh, uh, scan and how he presented. So as you could see here, there's, there's an abnormality. Um, this is the left part of the brain, the, this, the way the normal scans are done, they're, they're flipped. Uh, and there's a lesion there, and you can see it there. And these are the different uh, uh, images: is a coronal view and a sagittal view from from the side. So, looking at anatomy, this lesion is, you know, it's 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 there somewhere. So, what's happening to the mayor's arcuate fasciculus? Exactly where is his arcuate uh, fasciculus? And that's critical to identify because to take this out and to do it safely, really, you want to avoid. The, the fasciculus, because then he would not be able to talk if that uh, if that's uh, injured. And so we did uh, tractography on him and you could see here how this is the, his arcuate fasciculus is being severely displaced by this large lesion inside of his brain. And if, if you could see here, this is the lesion and you could see how the fibers really are right at the edge. The, 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 there's no room for error, zero room for error uh, with, with something that's that is uh, that close. And after having a long discussion, you know, we suspected at the beginning that this was a very benign type of tumor. Benign doesn't mean that it's not going to cause problems, just that it doesn't metastasize, doesn't go anywhere else. It's actually like skin, something called an epidermoid. That's what we thought uh, preoperatively. And next, what I'll do is I'll show you the, the surgery. So here's uh, this is the mayor's uh, brain uh, right there. And you could see through the surface of the brain actually this white uh, uh, lesion which is the typical appearance of an epidermoid uh, within the cellian fissure which actually is a very very rare location for this lesion this is the mayor's temporal lobe his frontal lobe is, is on top and we're very very carefully going through it now it's in the cellian fissure which is an area that there are a lot of very very important blood vessels uh, in that uh, region so we're going and we're very very gently removing uh, the whole uh, epidermoid and this this is his middle cerebral artery again that goes to the area that controls the movement um, of the right side of his body as well as the speech if this artery is injured you know very likely he would have a massive uh, stroke so being able to remove it uh, carefully inspecting that uh, that uh, whole area to uh, again be absolutely sure that we've uh, removed uh, as much of it as possible uh, coming out, really inspecting that area. And as I told you, his arcuate fasciculus is really plastered a, a, around the cavity uh, and around uh, that lesion. So we took the lesion out uh, and he did well. He can describe to you a little better. Um, this was a very compelling uh, story and UPMC actually made a short commercial, which I'll show here uh, next, which was actually featured uh, on, the, on the Super Bowl day. So here's a, uh, the commercial. The number one job of an elected official is to be able to communicate and to have that taken from me would have been catastrophic. In July of this year, a neurologist said to me, we've discovered a very large mass inside your brain. 
it's not something we can even remotely consider operating in here. You've got to find somebody that can do this. There's a very good chance you're never going to be able to speak again. What good is a mayor if you can't communicate? I had talked to doctors in Boston, some of the best hospitals in New York City. More than one physician pulled me aside and said, there's only one guy that can do the surgery in the world. And it's Dr. Robert Freelander at UPMC. What's special at UPMC is the combination of the very best technology and very expert hands to be able to take care of these complex tumors. I think I've said it before, uh, just how grateful I am to be alive. I'll never forget it. Look, I didn't choose to have a brain tumor, but I did choose UPMC. Well, again, a terrific uh, story. And what I'd like to ask uh, as I'm uh, concluding the presentation part of uh, of this is to ask uh, Mayor Bowden to provide some words about um, you know his recovery, how he's done, and uh, any other words that he would have. So, uh, Mayor, please uh, take it over. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Freelander, yesterday I had the opportunity and the luck to sneak out for a round of golf, and I shot a 78. So, um, anybody who's had brain surgery uh, 22 months ago and can go out and do that, it's pretty darn good. Um, look, um, my outcome, I understand, is maybe not necessarily an outcome everybody gets, um, and I'm blessed and honored to be able to have received that, but you and what you do at UPMC uh, provide the best chance at that kind of outcome. And so, um, sure, there are days when you get headaches. I think I've called you a couple times and said, what do you think? And you're like, go lay down and, and, and you'll be okay. And that's very true. And so there's definitely adjustment. I would tell anybody going through this kind of surgery that generally it takes about 12 to 18 months to really sort of get yourself back to where you were. Now, I was in the middle of a gubernatorial cam campaign. I was running for governor. So I left UPMC came back, drove back to uh, Connecticut and attended a fundraiser two nights later. Um, and, uh, you know, just pushed as hard as I could. And I would, wouldn't recommend that for most people, but in general, I just didn't have an option to wait. So um, I think that all of those things come together uh, to make you feel um, that you're cared for and that uh, there's compassion and, and certainly a little bit of caring and courage that goes into all making this happen. But really, um, uh, it's been an incredible outcome. I, to, what you do and all the people that are on this today uh, who are your patients is a testament to your caring and concern, doctor. And so we, we just all want to thank you uh, publicly for for the, for just making us better people and, and living a, a life that all of us can be proud of. Well, uh, Mayor, it's been uh, wonderful to to gotten to know you uh, over over the years and looking forward to many more uh, years of a uh, of a friendship as well, as well as I know a number of my patients are on here uh, uh, today. So, uh, Justin, do you want to go ahead and take it over and um, I'm going to address some questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Freelander. And I guess um, we have a, a couple for for uh, Mayor Bowton, so we'll just uh, we'll start with you. Uh, first, we'll just start with a comment. Uh, uh, Mayor Bowton, thank you for sharing your story today. What an amazing story and outcome. So just a nice comment there. Um, here's a question. What impressed you most when you met Dr. Friedlander for the first time? Well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to say all of his patients have the same experience. Um, here's, here's a most amazing thing uh, that I thought about the whole thing. Um, when my physician contacted Rob, Dr. Freelander, um, he said, look, send me the film. I can't give you a lot of answers till I look at all the film. And so I sent everything out to him FedEx. And I literally thought it would go into a black hole. And I might hear from somebody in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. He got back to me within about three days with a complete analysis and a careful analysis of what he saw and said, get out of here as soon as you can. I can fix you. Uh, and um, everybody's a little skeptical, especially after getting turned away by so many other uh, wonderful institutions that do great work. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. I mean, that can't that can't be the case. But when I started doing my research and understanding who I was talking to, the fact that somebody was that confident, that courageous, that real, and said, you know, get on the next plane, get in the car, whatever you need to do, and and we can we can fix this, um, was stunning to me. And uh, how quick the turnaround was. He provides a personal touch at a level uh, that he's at that you don't normally see. You know, usually there's three layers between uh, a person and the surgeon, um, and you usually have to work your way through them to get to the surgeon. Um, th Dr. Freelander isn't like that. I, I also attribute that a little bit to sort of the Pittsburgh 
um, Midwest, um, you know, uh, attitude versus like a New York or a Boston attitude in terms of how uh, culturally how people interact with each other. But in general, um, it was just incredible how responsive, uh, compassionate and caring. Uh, and he's on point. Uh, at one point uh, during the recovery, uh, I did spike a temperature. I, 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 the one thing he told me to do was not get an infection. So I went and got an infection. And um, he was at an event uh, in a tux, and, and my sisters got a hold of him at 11 o'clock at night. And he gave very defined instructions about what to do. And he said, I'll see you in the emergency room at you know 5 a.m. And that's what we did. And I, I just can't say enough about uh, the personalized care that you get out of UPMC and out of Dr. Freelander and really the whole team there, everybody from Diane to um, everybody that's there. They're just fantastic. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, here, another question for you. Were you surprised to learn that Pittsburgh is such an innovation, innovative leader in healthcare and technology? What did you know about Pittsburgh before your surgery? Two part question there. Well, I was a Steelers fan back in the 70s, so I knew I knew a little football, but um, frankly, no, I was not surprised. Um, I was surprised, but uh, in a way, once I got there, I, I got it. You know, it's meds and eds that's out there and that's what's driving this new economy of Pittsburgh, which is fascinating to me. And I've actually sent people out there to meet with UPMC people to talk a little bit. How do we bring this model of care to Connecticut? We're a small state. Um, 3.5 million people. There should be no reason why we can't do what's being done out there. Right now, we have a bunch of siloed off great institutions, but nobody talks. There's patient poaching that goes on. There's, you know, all kinds of stuff, multiple silos. And, and so I thought, boy, if we could have a comprehensive approach to healthcare care in Connecticut, uh, we could save a lot of lives and, and deliver a higher a higher level of care and save, and save money. Um, so uh, I wasn't that surprised, but I got to tell you, I am impressed by Pittsburgh and the reinvention that they've gone through. It's one of my favorite cities. Uh, you know, if you said, what are your favorite cities in America? I, and I've toured a lot of them. Uh, I would put Pittsburgh probably number one or number two. Nashville is right there um, and some other ones that are that are emerging. But um, I think Pittsburgh has got it going on and I think you all are on the right track and uh, any city in, in the U.S. would be wise to follow your path. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so you said you golfed yesterday. I've golfed with you. You're a great golfer, but a uh, great question here. How has this experience changed your life? Well, you, you do have a, a new appreciation for life. Um, I think that uh, I've become a kinder and gentler soul. Uh, I think I've taken a step back once in a while and um, learned how to relax. Um, you know, you don't get re elected and reelected 10 straight times for 20 years um, if you're not doing something right. And that my right was just to try to overcome everything with hard work. Um, and sometimes now I will take a few moments out to go out and smell the roses and, and, and go for a walk or just enjoy life. Um, and also, I think there's a, a new compassion that I bring to people uh, that I never had before that are facing health care issues that are facing um, sometimes impossible health care issues where uh, I'll spend a little more time listening and, and trying to develop a strategy or, or just an idea or thought to, to help them. So it's made me a better person. I think God does things to people for reasons. Uh, I think this was my thing, and there may be, there probably will be others. That's the way life is. Um, but um, thanks to the people out there and to the experience I've been through and, you know, to, to Dr. Freelander and his family too, uh, I'm a better person because of it. Great. Thank you so much for that, Mayor. Uh, Dr. Freelander, a couple of uh, questions for you. First, I'll start, start off with a comment. Um, just definitely Dr. Freelander is the best. Thanks for the opportunity to listen to this eminence. So uh, wonderful comment there. Um, Dr. Freelander, how can you apply your findings in Mayor Bouton's case to other patients' cases? Well, what I could say is that I've learned from every single uh, time I've, I've used this uh, tractography. And I, mean, I learn every time I go into somebody's brain, but in particularly, but particularly when we use the tractography, the first first uh, case uh, I used was Ashley, uh, which again is uh, the, the young lady that uh, uh, made that uh, beautiful uh, watercolor that bled 10 years later. Um, and I, I believe she's listening uh, as well. We went into it and it was a research tool. I wasn't quite sure exactly what the technology was telling me. And after we used it, 
and she did so well. And then we did a repeat tractography and I saw that those fibers were pushed back and there were very few of them, but she was still able to move. So here's the key part. When I saw her, she was not moving the, the right side of her body, her arm and leg. And I could have said, those fibers are gone. They're never coming back. And I was thrilled for many reasons as she began to regain her strength after the surgery, after we removed the, the bleeding and the cavernoma, uh, and we saw the fibers come back. That, that to me was, was like an aha moment because it told me that because somebody has a deficit, doesn't mean 100% that it's gone. Many times it will be because those fibers are severed and once they're severed, they don't come back. If the lesion itself pushes them back and then you relieve the pressure, you can think of a cable that's being squeezed and the information can't get through. You relieve the pressure and now the information gets through. However, if surgically you cut a fiber, it never comes back. So I, I learned so much from it and I was so excited through that wasn't that day because it was a process of understanding it. And then we've applied it over and over and over again. And I've learned from every single case uh, on, on as to what the meaning is of the tractography from a technological point of view, the tractography is getting better and better as well as our experience uh, uh, with it. Uh, you know, to know that you're really right next to the fibers. I mean, I've told uh, the mayor uh, as well as an example, uh, after surgery, right when he was waking up for a few minutes, he wasn't talking. I was scared. I said, <laughs> is this the end of this political career? Or you could say, uh, the flip side, some uh, some people would like to have some politicians not talk, but that's a that's different right. that's a different topic and we're not gonna go there. Um, I, I I thought that that you know everything I was trying to prevent I wasn't able to and what happens is that right after surgery as your as anesthesia is wearing off the fibers that are not working perfectly well are are the ones that recover the last and within you know half an hour to an hour after surgery he started to talk and talk and he hasn't shut up since <laughs> uh, it's 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 been uh, it's it's been wonderful but again that just shows me how close we were to those functions. And the fact that, uh, you know, he wasn't talking and then he was, you, know, you learn and, and you become more and more confident of what you're doing as you see each one of those cases. So I must say, I've learned from every single one of these cases where we've used tractography. We've used it in cavernomas, as I've showed many examples, uh, with some benign lesions like the mayor's uh, lesion was, or some more malignant uh, tumors and deeper tumors. And from each one of them, uh, I learn, and I'm, I'm fortunate and delighted that people are coming here from all over the world, uh, from many different uh, countries to, for us to be able to do this, this kind of procedure. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Freelander. And a, a great segue to our next question here. Can you explain how tractography works? So tractography is an MRI-based technique for the patient, they go into the MRI. They don't, uh, uh, it's no different uh, for them. What the MRI can do is can detect the flow of the water molecules and the movement of uh, water molecules. And what happens is the, what are called the axons, the projections from the neurons, the way that neurons communicate from one another is with, with uh, structures called dendrites and axons. But the, the white matter fibers where the connections are, the, that arcuate fasciculus is an example of the cortical spinal tract, are, are fibers or cables if you think of it. So the water molecules move up and down in a restricted way. And again, what the MRI can do in a very detailed uh, manner is to analyze the flow of water molecules and analyze it in a way that we, we then uh, are able to uh, see the, the tractography and all of that. Some of the great advances that have been made here is that uh, when they're swelling around a tumor, it's very hard to detect the tractography properly. And uh, you know, our team here has developed algorithms to really delineate that and get rid of that. When fibers cross, there's a lot, it's like a highway and you have fibers crossing from one to the other. The area of where the fibers are crossing, uh, it's very hard to see where something starts and where something finishes. And that, then you can get what's called false continuation, where you can go in from one crossing into the wrong one. And that again, as I said, that's something that DTI and, and other tractography protocols have not uh, really solved. And one that our um, uh, techniques here at uh, Pitt and UPMC were able to delineate that. So the, the way that the, uh, the, the data comes out 
is, in, is improved and the, the fidelity of it. And again, that's what I've learned from case after case. I, I know what is it that I can trust, what is it that I cannot trust. So it's, it's, it's information work very, very closely together with a, with a team of you know, Frank Ye. Uh, as I said, he's one of the PhDs that's working with us. Some, some of our, our residents uh, and, and student, uh, uh, David Fernandez, uh, and Ms. Barrios, Dr. Barrios is working uh, with her, with us, that uh, we're able to really detect these. We sit down and we study them. We go into the OR, we look at them together. So again, it's experience and learning from this amazing technique. Thank you, doctor. We have lots of uh, tractogra tractography questions, so we might have to do a week on that alone. Uh, are you able to compare your experience with other tractography-based methods and put into context with the fact that HDFT is better? So a couple of things. One, there was actually a publication. There was an international competition where there was uh, data submitted and analyzed. Um, so again, this was done uh, independently, and then they ranked all the different uh, tractography uh, methods. And the one that again that was submitted from the University of Pittsburgh ended up being number one. So on the one hand, there is a uh, technical uh, information to let us know that this is very very accurate and it's a, a terrific. Uh, uh, technique number one. Number two, uh, some of the PhDs that are working on this are embedded within the Department of Neurosurgery. So we're working very, very closely together and learning from one another. There's a lot of uh, cross pollination from what they're doing and what we're doing. We're learning from one another. So it's the combination of what I believe is the best technical uh, tractography in the world plus a fantastic collaboration and, and experience. Thank you, Dr. Freelander. Um, do you use fiber tracking in all of your cases? Uh, no, uh, we, we don't use it for all the cases. I use it for uh, as many as I can. It, it's, a, it's a limited resource in, in, in one way, but on the other hand, there are many cases that I just don't need. It. Uh, we know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, I do a lot of other kinds of cases, for example, aneurysms that you, you wouldn't need it, but for tumors and deep tumors, I, I use them uh, as often as, as I need to, it's available here for us uh, uh, to use, but I don't use them for all the cases. Thank you, Dr. Freelander. Um, I make gifts to the Department of Neurosurgery. Uh, does this help develop new technology? And what is something that is on the forefront? Well, I uh, appreciate that question and uh, you know, hope that some of the people that have uh, donated to my work and the work of others in the Department of Neurosurgery are listening. They're highly uh, appreciated. Uh, uh, federal funding uh, is limited uh, as well as takes a lot of work to get them, but it's very worthwhile to get because it really uh, provides you a status, a research status that you have these kind of federal funds uh, that are approved uh, by the highest and most stringent uh, criteria. But in addition to that, philanthropic uh, support is uh, extremely helpful for us to be able to do additional things. So we're able to take risks uh, that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So our department, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the largest department of neurosurgery in the country. We have many, many different uh, research uh, projects spanning uh, the full gamut of uh, neurosurgery and neurological uh, diseases. We have clinical research. Uh, we have very applied research. We have a laboratory basic science uh, research. I have my own uh, laboratory where we're studying uh, the causes and the, and the manner in which cells die in the brain. As you know, once a cell dies in the brain, usually it does not come back. Uh, and we're studying a number of diseases, including Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's, ALS, as well as uh, um, head uh, trauma, spinal cord injury, and stroke. Because in, in all of these, the commonality is that uh, the cells in the brain are dying. And what do we do to stop them from dry, from uh, dying? So any kind of uh, support that we get is uh, extremely uh, helpful and appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Freelander. Um, I love this question. How do patients like Mark inspire you? Inspire you in your work? Well, when uh, when I see uh, uh, Mark, uh, uh, Ashley, Heather, and so many other uh, uh, patients, uh, when I see their smile and I see them walking. Um, and I see, you know, what impact we have on, on their life. And the one thing that I know is that every time that I open somebody's skull and I'm in their brain, I, I realize this is somebody's brother, sister, son, whatever family member loved uh, one, a, a friend, um, that, you know, anything that goes wrong is going to have a lifelong 
impact. And if I can do the very best I can, it transforms uh, somebody's life. So when I see um, the smile of my patients and I see um, you know, their good outcomes, it gives me tremendous uh, you know, energy and enthusiasm to continue to move forward. Uh, although I wish every single outcome was uh, perfect, uh, we know that you know some patients don't always do perfectly well, and that you know you strive to do the best that you can with every patient uh, that you can. Uh, this is a, a teaching institution as well. We work very closely together with the best residents in the country. Uh, these are gifted uh, uh, residents that we get uh, through competing, uh, as I said, uh, throughout uh, the nation and teaching them how to do these procedures and working you know, shoulder by shoulder uh, and doing these very complicated surgeries when they come in. Um, obviously, they don't know how to do brain surgery, uh, training in neurosurgery seven years, and when they walk out of here, I am so proud of them. They're, they're just amazing in terms of what they do, and they really bring the Pittsburgh uh, excellence and, tra and tradition throughout the country with whatever positions uh, they get. You, often they get uh, coveted uh, academic uh, positions, which are very difficult and competitive uh, uh, to get. So again, going back to your question, the, the, the pipeline from your patient, when they come in to see you, often it's the worst day or the most scary day in their life when they're starting through this uh, journey and when they come out well and they have a smile that gives you just so much uh, energy and fulfillment to, uh, to go on. We work very, very hard hours. Uh, you know, often I come in uh, at 6 and leave at uh, 7, 8 uh, p.m. So these are long days and uh, you called in at night uh, to do uh, surgery and to evaluate uh, patients. So it's a very arduous and emotional uh, experience often um, when your patients don't do well. It's, uh, you know, you, you take a hit from that and you try to do the best that you can and be a teacher, uh, love my family, be a family man, uh, and, uh, and come home with a smile. Dr. Freelander, thank you so much. And we're kind of coming to the end of our, uh, our time, a lot of time here, but I just wanted to uh, relay one more, uh, I guess, comment from, from one of our attendees. And it said, Heather's mom here, thank you for saving my daughter's life. So I think that's a great way to sort of end the uh, the presentation here. I just want to thank you and uh, Mayor Bouton and Dr. Freelander. Would you like to uh, end the presentation for us today? Well, again, uh, I want to thank uh, everybody watching. I want to particularly thank uh, the mayor uh, for just uh, uh, being, a, being a friend and being a friend to myself and my family, as well as to our department. Uh, in uh, general, you're an incredibly special uh, uh, individual that uh, you know, you're, the, you're the definition of caring. You care for your city. I remember uh, when you were describing to me your experience through the, through the Sandy Hook uh, shooting, which uh, was uh, you know, the town right next to yours and, and what you did uh, there. I mean, it's just such a moving uh, experience. So again, thank you for, for joining uh, me uh, today. I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, Next week, I'll mention that Dr. George, uh, George Zenernos uh, will be uh, the uh, speaker, uh, Mayor Bowden. If you want to listen to him, he was my assistant at your surgery. Uh, oh, so yeah, yeah, George, yeah, yeah. So, so now he's, uh, he's uh, graduated and he's just phenomenal and I hired him uh, to stay here. So he'll be the speaker uh, next week. So thank you all and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank you for joining us. Have a good weekend.